Shalom, giving all praise to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh Bahasham, Yahweh Shai Bahasham, Racha HaKurash. Double honors to the apostles and elders at Great Millstone, Ruel, and as always, we have peace and salutations unto the elect. And I wanted to do a, a video on um, the Bible Project's breakdown of the book of Obadiah. And there's a lot of holes within their um, overview. Um, this is a uh, channel which, uh, if you wanted to get, you know, bits of information, they do, you know, when they go into the scriptures, they bring out particular uh, histories and things that you, you know, uh, can uh, add to your repertoire, you know, uh, sort of add to your armor. But um, they don't have the breakdown. Um, if you can get past the presenter's voice, um, you can pretty much learn a little bit. All right, just to add, you know, those little bits of uh, history and information that sometimes, you know, um, give a little more spice to the scriptures uh, as we bring it out. Uh, this is one of those sites you can get those from. But um, overall, you know, they don't have the breakdown, you know. And um, when dealing with the book of Obadiah, we know what it says, um, but we're going to listen to it. And uh, just break it down um, the right way just to show you how, you know, this is the one book. I have a book, I uh, forget the name of it, that breaks down every book of the Bible. But the book of Obadiah is the only one that they didn't break down. And this is a book that for years these Edomites tried to uh, hide from. But since we've been on the scene, you know, um, on YouTube openly proclaiming that, you know, these people are the Edomites. You've seen more and more of them start to openly talk about Esau and openly uh, try to break down, you know, where they are. You have a lot of people who say that the Edomites are done away with. But when we go into biblical prophecy, which is where the answers lie, there's there, there's no way. You know, as we know, according to the scriptures, Esau would have the fatness of the earth. All right. There is no nation that has ruled the earth to this extent that this current nation who rules this beast system has ran it. There's nowhere in history. A lot of people try to say, well, the people who are ruling the day, the so-called European is uh, the, the Japhet, the so-called white man is Japhet. Well, that makes no sense. Okay, that makes no sense because nowhere in biblical prophecy were we to have this sort of punishment coming onto the Lord from Japhet. As a matter of fact, Let's get this real quick in the book of Lamentations, the fourth chapter. Now, those very same people will tell you, well, we're at the end and they feel like the Lord is coming back in our time. Well, if that's true, all right, then Esau, Edom has to be the one in rulership. And let's prove that via prophecy because Esau, Edom would control, all right, this uh, daughter of Babylon. This is Lamentation 4 and 21 which Babylon is the final captivity. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, okay, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee, and thou shalt be drunken and make thyself naked. The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover thy sins. So our uh, punishment will be accomplished through the Lord delivering us out of the hands of Esau Edom, which is the final captivity. So if this is the very end, according to prophecy, that fourth beast that you read about in Daniel, the seventh chapter and the little horn that came from it will be ran by the Edomites. OK, the Edomites were synonymous with Rome, Edom, Rome, and all of these things have been coming out. But let's go ahead and listen to uh, their breakdown a little where we can get some uh, edification and show you the air. All right, because the Lord said he would give us a mouth that no one would be able to gainsay. And as we bring out prophecy, scripture, these these people can't deal with the true children of the Lord. OK, through the spirit. The book of the prophet Obadiah. This is the shortest book in the whole Old Testament. It's a mere 21 verses. And at first glance, it does not look very promising. It's a series of divine judgment poems against the ancient people of Edom, which was a nation that neighbored Israel on the other side. You see how he's already starting to say which was a nation, the ancient people of Edom. All right. But when you read the prophecy, it's for a future time. That's already there. They're, they're using wording 
to try to present to you that the biblical Edomites are either no longer here or this is something that, you know, already happened. Okay. Now, within the book of Obadiah, there are things brought up that have already happened. All right. Some of the uh, their transgressions against Israel. All right. But let's keep listening. The dead. See, however, there is way, way more going on here. So first, here's the backstory. The people of Edom were unique because they had a shared ancestry with the Israelites. They both belonged to the family of Abraham, who, with Sarah, had their son Isaac, who, with his wife Rebekah, had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Now, the book of Genesis told us the story of these two brothers, and to say the very least, they had a tense relationship. They right, and the main thing that you get from that when you get Genesis 25... Genesis chapter 25, um, <clears throat> we'll go down to the point when the uh, prophet, through the spirit of Yahweh, told, okay, uh, Isaac and Rebekah, why the nations were struggling in her womb. And here's the answer. Verse 23 said, and the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people. So two separate nations were in her womb, which a lot of people get bugged out about that. But the same thing happened under Adam with Cain and Abel and then Seth. All right. Two different nationalities of people. All right. Two different promises, two different vibrations. Now, how could this happen? Well, because <laughs> Adam and Isaac, okay, were Yahawashai and both good and evil, okay, came out of his loins, man, because it was the will of the most high God, Yahweh. All right. And he can do that. You see? And there was a brother who... um one of the Mississippi brothers, uh, I forget his name, man, it's, it's escaping me. He went into the whole uh, science of the twins and how this can be possible, man. All right, but um, let's see here. And you could just go to my page and type in two nations or the womb, and it, it, you can find that video where the brother breaks that down. But it says two nations are in thy womb. Two separate nationalities are in thy womb. Okay, and two manner of people, two different spirits, two different vibrations shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. So right here, we get the narrative that these two aren't equal. You see that? And as these two were born, you know, they had, you know, a, a offspring, which ultimately in the scriptures are the bulk of prophecy will be fulfilled through these two, the, the nation of uh, Israel, which would be through Jacob and the nation of Edom, which would be through Esau. Both of them receive blessings that are very, very pertinent to the understanding of what's happening in the earth. And right now we're living at the time of Esau's blessing, which was the fatness of the earth in the ruling of the world by the sword. And we know that Esau Edom had a special hatred for Jacob and, and he said it himself, he would kill Jacob, which explains a lot of what's going on today with us, the so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans, and the so-called white race and what they've done to us, all right? And the nation of Edom is still here. Let's keep listening. They each later received the names Israel and Edom, which eventually became the name of the families that descended from them. And these families replayed the same difficult relationship of their ancestors. Israel and Edom had enormous tensions throughout the centuries, but they still shared that family bond. You see that? that? They still shared that family bond. Now, there was a point where Jacob, you know, wanted to get it right with Esau, but Esau still had his mind to be a demon and you can see that pop up throughout history you know uh agag haman you know um uh, herod various different uh biblical characters that you know hey the the greeks the romans you know <laughs> the uh hanukkah man it was a it was ultimately a celebration which the messiah celebrated you know it was a celebration of the lord delivering us out of the hands of edom let's keep listening that bond that was betrayed and shattered in the tragic events of Jerusalem's fall to Babylon. So when Israel was invaded and conquered by Babylon, the people of Edom took advantage by plundering other Israelite cities and then capturing and even killing Israelite refugees. Now in other prophetic books... And um, you can read that history in uh, First Edras, you know, the fourth chapter... Um, just read First Ezra, the whole book. It's a, it's a very good history, but it goes into how the Edomites helped, 
you know, the Babylonians take us down. They've always throughout history waited for moments to attack. Whenever they seen us fall, they would help the enemy or aid us in our fall, man. Even unto this day, you know, like they like in Haiti, when when that, you know, manufactured earthquake, Lord, you know, most likely happened. What did they do? They showed up over there trafficking children, stealing, you know, um, um, you know, uh, organs and selling them. Pedophile rings were being set up, you know, and that's what they do. All right. But you see here he has Psalms 137. He has Ezekiel 35 and he has Amos 1, 6 through 9. Let's get Psalms 137 because those scriptures are future prophecies of what would take place. You see? And the Edomites are still here. This is Psalms 137 and 7. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom. In the day of Jerusalem, who said, race it, race it, even to the foundation thereof. And this is David prophesying of what they would do, all right, when the Babylonians sacked the temple. O daughter of Babylon, but he's speaking of the daughter of Babylon, which the daughter of Babylon has a whole different judgment than the ancient Babylon, the, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, which, you know, you had Nebuchadnezzar, you had the Chaldeans, and so forth. They were taken down by the Medes. In the Persians, okay, and you can read that in Daniel, the uh, fifth chapter. This this prophecy we're reading was not fulfilled at that time. So this is speaking of a daughter of Babylon, that would be the control of the earth in the latter days, which is the fulfillment of Esau having the fatness of the earth. You see that Babylon is the control of the earth. They control the earth, Babylon, the beast system. All right. And that's how Esau's blessing of the fatness of the earth will be fulfilled. Because none of you can show us any nation who ruled the earth in its entirety through the sword and through their policy. Outside of the people who rule it now. You've had nations who re ruled regions of the earth. But you never had anyone rule the earth to its entirety. It says, O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewarded thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stone. And this is a future prophecy. This did not happen at that time. So the daughter of Babylon, and you could just type in daughter and Babylon, is a is in, in one of the most uh, you know notable scriptures is Isaiah the uh, forty seven chapter. Okay, uh, which basically is a future prophecy that you can link directly with Revelation, the 18th chapter, which is speaking of a new Babylon, okay, that will come in the latter days, okay, when you read Revelation, the 18th chapter, okay, and Jeremiah, the 51st chapter, Jeremiah, the 50th chapter, which those were letters from Jeremiah to the captors at Babylon, but when you read the judgment, it's speaking of a new Babylon that will come in the latter days where we will be delivered from and that will be destroyed by fire and by a different company of nations shooting missiles on it. That's all throughout that those chapters, man. And us being delivered forever. Also, Revelation, the 18th chapter, it talks about how Babylon, that great city, would be destroyed. Okay, and how we would be delivered and how we would rejoice over her. All right. And the Lord will put out the light of their candle, which is wickedness, their priesthood on the left hand side. And this is a future prophecy. This is not something that took place in the Old Testament, because when you read Revelation. The first chapter, it clearly tells you. The revelation of Yahweh Shai Hamashiach, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. OK shortly come to pass man meaning it would be in the future the mark of the beast all of these things would be in the future man and in our time it may seem like it took you know a, a long time but really this was a little season little this i mean really this uh, uh in, in in the spiritual sense was a was a short time man but these things that are written in the book of revelation are things that will come to pass in the future so when did Revelation 18 take place. When was Babylon the Great destroyed? And clearly what we just read ties the biblical Edomites to Babylon the Great. 
okay, in these various different uh, scriptures, uh, most notable Psalms 137, which he had written down. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed. But he linked it to the biblical Edomites as you read that. Okay? And you could also read Ezekiel, the 35th chapter, Amos 1 and 6, how they broke the brotherly covenant, and so forth. So ultimately, Ezekiel 35 and Psalms 137 are future prophecies, but he just put them there. You see, I mean, you got to go into that and break that down. God held Israel's neighbors accountable for this kind of violence. That's and right. so here, Obadiah does the same for Edom. The short book has two halves. The first part is a series of accusations against the leaders of Edom, specifically for their pride and self-exaltation. And the leaders of Edom are the Amalekites, okay, Teman, you know, which was known for their wise, uh, 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 their wisdom, you see? Literally, as they lived up high in the desert rocks, but also metaphorically, they truly believed they were superior to the Israelites. That's right. And it's that problem. And, and that's the, what they have pushed through white supremacy, Edomite supremacy. This whole system is them exalting themselves above us, the Most High, above the wisdom of the Most High, above the Most High's plans and everything else. Through Babylon the Great, the NATO and the EU is when this all would fully be fulfilled that led the Edomites to not just stand idly by when Babylon came to destroy Jerusalem, but actually to participate in the destruction. And so God says through Obadiah that Edom will be brought down from their height and destroyed. As they have done to Israel, so it will be done to them. Now, right when you think you're going to hear more about how Edom will meet its doom, the topic suddenly shifts in verse 15. We hear this, the day of the Lord is near against all nations. You see that? And the day of the Lord has not come yet. You see? It has not come yet. It's coming. It's on its way, but it has not come yet. And this is why the Lord is gathering all of the armies of you heathen over into uh, uh, Yahweh Shapat, which is where the decision and judgment will be made and the chariots will return and deliver us, man. Now, why do we all of a sudden shift from Edom now to all nations? This first is a hinge piece, and it links the first half of the book to the second half, where Obadiah announces the day of the Lord, but not only for Edom. He widens his focus to include all nations. Mm -hmm. And Obadiah says that all prideful nations that act like Edom will face God's justice in the same way. They'll fall from their prideful heights and come to ruin. Now, the combination of these two sections, one about Edom, the other about all nations, shows us why Obadiah was so interested in this tiny southern neighbor of Israel. Obadiah because all nations are going to be shut down when Yahweh Shai returns. Let's get this uh, in the book of Revelation, the 19th chapter. And like I said, he's on point with some of the history, but I just thought this can be a point of edification for, uh, you know, maybe newcomers or those who don't fully understand how to link all these things together, because we have various uh, lessons where we, you know, link Babylon, this modern day Babylon to uh, Esau, Edom. It's very uh, uh, beautiful how the Lord secretly put it so a spiritual man can link all of these things together. And Lord willing, we're those men and Lord willing, you know, uh, you're being edified. This is uh, Revelation chapter 19. In 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. He comes in the volume of the book to fulfill all of the prophecies written. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. You see that? The, the, the chariots, pure. You see? And they tried to put that term white on themselves to make themselves pure. All right? But they're not. Okay? And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule over them with the rod of iron. You see that? And he treaded the, uh, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the almighty God. Okay, so the Lord is coming back to take down all of you heathen. And you can read that also in Daniel, the seventh uh, the, uh, the, uh, seven chapter. Okay, that's why it says he's going to have crowns, okay, on his head because he's coming down to conquer the nations and we're going to be joint heirs with him in rulership to beat them over the head with a rod of iron it's just that esau edom 
in uh, uh, end time prophecy is at the forefront of it. Okay, let's get that. A great example of that is here in Isaiah, the 34th chapter, where it says, Come near, ye nations, and hear, and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world, and all the things that come forth of it. For the indignation of Yahweh is upon all nations. See that? And his fury is upon their, all their armies. Now, he said all nations here, but there's a particular nation that he has his eye on. Because that who, that's who rules that little horn in Daniel, the seventh chapter, which would have rulership and dominion over the, the, the saints, the earth, the resources, and everything else, man. Okay? And all of the, the, the other heathen, too. He have utterly, it says, the, the indignation of Yahweh is upon all nations, and his fury is upon all their armies. He have utterly destroyed them and have delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses. And this is going to happen in the valley of Yahweh Shapat. This is where all of those uh, nations are being uh, brought and gathered in the east. And the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved. And all, their, all the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down as a leaf falleth from off the vine. And this can be linked directly with Revelation, the sixth chapter. I don't know if they're going to have that precept. Yep, Revelation, the sixth chapter, says the same thing, showing you this is talking about something in the future. Revelation 16 and 14, And heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. That hasn't happened yet. When did this happen? But going back up here, you see, and it says, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumia and upon the people of my curse to judgment. You see that? The people of my curse to judgment. And as you read down, it goes into the judgment of the daughter of Babylon. Okay? Uh, Isaiah 34 and 10. Oh, let's start at 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance in the year of the recompenses of the controversy of Zion. So that's directly tied with the people of the, uh, uh, of the Lord's curse, which are the biblical Edomites, man. You see? And that curse, which was put on Cain, which was leprosy and everything else, followed all right, through these Edomites, man. And there's a judgment because they have done a lot, but the Lord has uh, uh, preserved them unto the day of judgment, man which are these times, okay? And it says, um, in the, the streams shall be turned to pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone and the land thereof shall become a burning pitch. It shall not be quenched day nor night. And is not that the judgment of Babylon the Great? Isaiah the 13th chapter goes into that. Various other scriptures. The smoke thereof shall go up forever from generation to generation. It shall... Lie waste, none shall pass through it forever. So when did this happen? But the comorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And it shall stretch out. It, it shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness, man. And this can be directly tied. I'm pretty sure Isaiah the 13th chapter is going to come up. Boom. Also, Isaiah the 14th chapter, the downfall of the king of Babylon. Okay, which we just, you have to link it together. That's Esau, Edom. Isaiah 14 and 23 is speaking of the fall of Lucifer, which is the light bringer, which his light is going to be put out. Esau, Edom, man. Okay, Isaiah the 13th chapter and the 20th verse. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 13 and 19. In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And people get tripped out because you see ancient terms, but that's how the Lord does it. That which is then is now. Who's the modern-day Chaldean? The witches and warlocks who run this uh, uh, current system, man, on the left-hand side. But it says, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency in Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, which mean they will rule the earth, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. is going to be burnt by fire. Ancient Babylon was not burnt by fire. And it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Right now, people are still over there in the land of Iraq. So this is not talking about ancient Babylon. 
Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Neither shall their shepherds make their fold there. You got all of the Arabs set up over here, balling, you know, selling poison to Jake. You know, gas stations. The Lord is going to put it into all of this. But the wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell therein, and sat satires shall dance therein. So this is speaking of a future judgment of the daughter of Babylon, man. And the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses, and the dragons in their pleasant places. As a matter of fact, Let's get the book of Malachi, the first chapter. Okay. In verse 3, And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness, because Babylon the Great is his heritage. That's ultimately what his blessing was, to rule the earth through the sword, all right, ultimately being headed by Babylon the Great, but that's all going to be for a waste unto the dragons of the wilderness, man. You see? <laughs> Whereas Edom said, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. And the Lord, thus said the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord have indignation forever, man. And... Forever means forever, okay? Forever means forever, man. So the day of the Lord is upon all you heathen, but Esau is at the forefront of it. Daya sees Edom's pride and fall as an example, an image of how God will one day confront the pride of all nations and bring about their fall too. You see that? But let's see if he's going to tie it all together. Let's see how he breaks it down. <laughs> it's hardly coincidental that in Hebrew, the word Edom, or Edom, is spelled with the exact same letters as the word humanity, or in Hebrew, Adam. In Obadiah... He broke that down wrong. Okay, it's really Adawam. Okay? It's really Adawam. And Adam doesn't mean humanity, it means from the dust. Edom's rise and fall is a parable of how God's justice will one day oppose pride and violence among all nations in the day of the Lord. He said it's a parable, right? <laughs> you see that? Not actual uh, uh, something that would actually take place through a particular seed line of Edomites. He said it's a parable of what would happen to all nations. But as in all the prophets, God's judgment is never his final word. Specifically, remember the conclusion of the two books that came right before Obadiah, Joel and Amos. God's judgment is his final word. Joel had painted a picture of what will happen after the day of the Lord against all nations. He said that God would perform a new act of salvation in Jerusalem and that all who humbled themselves and called upon him would be delivered. Amongst the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, let's get Joel 2. Because he's trying to throw in that, you know, all nations can be saved. That's just not true. Salvation is ultimately the law, statutes, and commandments being written in you. Meaning death no longer has dominion over you. That is not a promise in covenant that was made to all nations, man. This is Joel chapter 2. And... 26 let's see here and you shall eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of Yahweh your God that have dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am Yahweh your God and none else none else man that's why Daniel said the kingdom shall not be left to other people but for the saints the saints are the descendants of Jacob who will be heirs to the promise of that land. Physical descendants of Jacob is not something you can believe yourself into because the seed of Israel is still here in the planet Earth just as the seed of all of the nations are still here in the planet Earth. Okay? Edom, the seed of Edom is still here in the planet Earth, man. None else. I am your God and none else. My people shall never be ashamed. 
So the book of Joel does not offer a salvation to all nations, man. As a matter of fact, when you read Joel, it speaks of a future, how in the future, okay, that you nations are going to pay, you know, particularly the Hamites who sold us uh, uh, along with the Arabs to the so-called white man, you know. But as you read, verse 3 and 6, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold to the Grecians, all right, which are the, the, the Edomites who took on Japheth's uh, uh, name, man, calling themselves the Greeks. You could read about that with Alexander, but it really happened before him with his father. They started conquering particular Japhetic lands and took on the name of the Greeks. Okay, They're, they aren't the original Greeks. It says that ye might move them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them and return your recompense on your own head. And I will son, sell your sons and daughters into the hands of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabines, which I believe is an Arab. Ham, it's like ham mixed with Arab. But uh, to a people far off, for the Lord have spoken it. So when did this happen? When did the Israelites have a slave trade to where they sold off the heathen nations, man? Where is that written? Did it happen after Joel's prophecy? No, it didn't happen, man. So there's a lot of things hidden and written in prophecy that tell you the fate of the heathen, man. Okay, uh, uh, Psalms, the 49th chapter, man. You see? Now, after the period of a thousand years and you Edomites have done away with, yeah, we will deal fairly with the heathen. If they bless us, they will be blessed. But that does not take away from the fool, and they will never have the law, statutes, and commandments written in them. That's nowhere written in the scriptures that they can partake of the covenant where they will be immortal with those laws written. Those covenants were only made with one nation of people. The first covenant, okay, and the second covenant are only for the Israelites, straight up. And that land is only promised to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be direct heirs to that land. You have to be of that line. And that's what the scriptures say. And he, he, he posts Joel 2, okay, uh, where it says, Whoso uh, shall call upon the name of the Lord. Let's see. Joel 3, 2 and 32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion, who's Mount Zion? Okay, that's the, the, the Lord's monument, which is the nation of Israel, who he's going to remember. And in Jerusalem, all right, which New Jerusalem will be the fulfilled, perfected, okay, 144,000 and the rest of all Israel will follow in their perfection, shall be a deliverance. As the Lord said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Who's that remnant? That remnant is of Israel. That my channel name is Remnant Save 144. And all you have to do is type in remnant. The remnant of Israel is who's going to be saved. <laughs> you see? R Romans 9 and 27. Let's read it out of the New Testament. Isaiah also cried concerning israel though the number of the children of israel be as the sand of the sea a remnant shall be saved to be heirs to that promise man the remnant of israel shall not do iniquity nor speak lies man okay the remnant will return and that remnant that he was talking that and isaiah spoke that in uh, isaiah the 10th chapter only a remnant is going to return in the latter days though we be of the sand of the sea a remnant will return and repent man to be heirs to the promise of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to return to that land because that land was promised to Abraham, his seed, Isaac, his seed, Jacob, his seed, which were 12 tribes. So this guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And in the conclusion of Amos, he said that after the day of the Lord has judged Israel's evil, God would raise up the house of David and build a new kingdom for Israel that would include Edom and all the nations called by him. 
in my name. Let's get that in Amos, the ninth chapter. See that? He's trying to sneak in salvation for Edom. <laughs> Amos 9 and 11. In that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and I will close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins and build it as in the days of old. Now, right there, you have to go into history, and if he's building up the tabernacle of David as the days of old, you see, then... Were not the Edomites David's servants? First Chronicles 18 and 13, and he put garrisons in Edom, and all the Edomites became David's servants. Thus the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. So when David, you know, uh, had his kingdom, the Edomites were his servants. So if we're being built, and the tap to the tabernacle of David as the days of old, we're going to not only possess the Edomites, but we're going to possess their lands more importantly. We're going to get all of those lands and we're going to have dominion over them. We're going to rule over them. As a matter of fact, that is within the blessing that Isaac gave to East, to uh, Jacob. We'll go, come right back to that. But within the blessing, and this was reaffirmed when Esau came to Isaac and tried to get his blessing. No, I've made him Lord over you. This is Jacob's blessing, Jacob's blessing, man. Genesis 27 and 28. Therefore, God give thee the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren. Who's his brother? Who was Jacob's brother? The Edomites. He's going to be Lord over his brethren. And let thy mother's sons, the Edomites, bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that cursed thee, and blessed be he that blessed thee. And this was reaffirmed. Let's see here. When Esau came to cry for his blessing, what did Isaac say? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord. Let's look up the word Lord. I have made him thy Lord. God by Yar. Ruler. So the Edomites will be ruled over. Okay, he's gonna he's gonna hey he's gonna hey we're gonna rule over you. We're gonna be act proudly over you. We're gonna be we're gonna prevail over you. So right there is written within the promise that we're gonna have dominion and rulership over you, Edomite, right there in the blessing. So why is everybody trying to lie on the scriptures? Amos 9 and 11 is not saying that the Edomites are going to rule with, with, with the, uh, the Edomites are going to rule with the Israelites. That makes no sense. The Messiah is coming to deliver us from the hand of our enemies, not have a joint rulership with them. David's throne and Solomon's throne had no heathen sitting on the throne in joint rulership. Now Solomon dealt fairly with the heathen. You see, but there were particular of those nations who David rejoiced over having under his foot, man. In particular, the Moabites, the Edomites, and the, uh, uh, the Philistines, man. Which we're going to have that same sentiment when we take your asses down under Yahweh Shai, man. So I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. <laughs> which means we're going to be back in that same spirit all 12 tribes together, ruling out of the land, okay, ruling out of Jerusalem. That will be the capital. That will be where we set up shop, and it's going to be a per perfect kingdom. That they may possess the remnant of Edom, and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Now let's keep reading, because this is ultimately is talking about the land of the heathen, and we're going to possess them. The Lord told us in Revelation, the second chapter, he that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end, over him will I give power over the nations. Just as my father gave me power, you will be joint heirs with me and rule it over these heathen. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. 
They ain't saying the plowman and the reaper go be in joint rulership together. And the treader of grapes, the, the slave, okay, him that soweth seed. You see? Because for, for all of this time in our curse, we are the one who did all of the production, but we never reaped the benefits of what we produced. But we're going to overcome those who uh, have reaped of our benefits, man, of our what, what we've done. They've got rich off of the backs of the Israelites. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the way cities and inhabit them. How are we going to build them? Through you heathen being put to work. That's Isaiah 60 and so forth, man. And they shall plant vineyards and drink wine and drink the wine thereof. And they shall also make gardens to eat the fruit thereof. The gardens that we make, the heathen benefit from it, man. The vineyards that we plant, the heathen benefit from it. Not us, but in that day, we're going to benefit from them. And I will plant them upon their land, which was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they shall no more be pulled out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. So where in the hell does this say that there's going to be a joint rulership? As a matter of fact, let's get Daniel, man. Daniel chapter 7. Left. So lock you. Daniel chapter 2 and 44. And in the days of these kings, which are the, the, the heathen that are going to be taken down, show the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So it's not going to be left to other people the hell are you talking about but it's going to break in pieces and consume all of the heathen and it's going to stand forever and so the book of obadiah has been placed right after joel and then amos to expand on these very promises about the hope of god's kingdom over all of the nations. Man, shut up and so the book concludes with a very hopeful future god says he's going to restore his kingdom over the new jerusalem that he'll repopulate it with a faithful remnant. And then from there, God's kingdom will expand to include all the territory and nations around Israel. And we will rule over them. There won't be a joint rulership. And David's throne, show me any heathen that ruled and joined his rulership. Show me, I'll wait. And so this little book contributes to the larger portrait of God's justice and faithfulness that we're seeing in the prophets. The ancient pride and betrayal of the people of Edom becomes an example of the greater human condition. <laughs> all of the ways that we betray and hurt each other in God's good world. But no. there's hope, Obadiah says. Edom's downfall points to the day when God will deal with evil in our world, but also bring his healing kingdom of peace over all the nations. And that's what the book... No. No. That's not what that's talking about. And you're wrong, Salakia. You're wrong. Let's, uh, let's conclude what the book of Obadiah is talking about, you know. Obadiah verse... Uh, Fifteen, for the day of the Lord is near on all the heathen. And that's true. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Prepare slaughter for his children. Okay. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. All right. For you, as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, and they're over there calling themselves the, 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 the chosen people, the 1948ers, right? That lie, so shall all the heathen continually drink. Yea, they shall drink and shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not bent. But upon Mount Zion, which is for Israel, shall be a deliverance, and there shall be a holiness for the house of Jacob, which is the house of David, shall possess their possessions. <laughs> and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. So eventually they're going to be taken out of the earth, man. 
And that house is bayath, man. Okay? Meaning your family. All right? Your family, man. Descendants. You know? <laughs> hey. This is what the scriptures say. And they shall possess, and they of the house shall possess the Mount of Esau. So we're going to get all of these lands back, man. And possessing that area where Esau dwelt means what? We're going to have basically the king's highway. We're going to control trade. We're going to control resources. And they of the plain of the Philistines, and this is how Solomon uh, was so rich because David took down all of these particular regions and had control over them. So that meant money. That meant resources. And they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria. And Benjamin shall possess Gilead. We're going to ball, man. You see? So this is talking about all of the lands that we're going to possess. Okay? But the final thing is this. And Savior shall come up on the Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord. So it's going to be Esau's rulership that's going to be destroyed, which is going to be the end or be all. Es Esau's rulership will be addressed, and that's when the kingdom will come. Second Edges chapter 6 and 9. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. So Esau's rulership falling means the kingdom is going to come. The physical descendants of Esau would run modern-day Babylon, man. And this is why it says here in Isaiah 63. In one, who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra that is glorious in his apparel, the chariots traveling in the greatness of his strength, that I'm... I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. This is Yahawashai coming to deliver his elect. All right. And Edom is mentioned directly right there, man. For the day of vengeance, verse four, is in mine heart in the year of my redeemed is come. This has not happened. And when you read this, this can be directly linked to what we uh, read in Revelation, the 19th chapter, man. So. And this is a whole this whole chapter is good, man. You see. Let's listen to the prayer of Isaiah and we'll end it. Isaiah 63 and 17. O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways and harden our heart from thy fear? Return for thy servants' sake, for the tribes of thine inheritance. The people of thy holiness have possessed it but a little while. Forty years of peace is all we had, man. From there we were taken out of the land and basically over or through. Our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary, Jerusalem. You know, Israel, we are thine. Thou never bears rule over them. They were not called by thy name and they never will be. You see, but through us, the Israelites getting, you know, the kingdom, you know, there will be righteousness restored in the earth. And eventually, as the scriptures say, when the righteous are in authority, the people will rejoice. But you Edomites have been chosen in the movie to be those who that ruled this Babylon the Great, okay, that ultimately is likened to a spiritual Egypt. And when the Lord passes over, he's coming for your ass this time and to deliver his elect. So with that, hopefully y'all are edified. On to the next. Shalom.